This lecture explores the concept of social change. Social change is ubiquitous. It's everywhere all the time. It will affect every aspect of your life. Social change structures what we can think about and what is outside the realm of what we can think, or what Foucault calls the realm of the unfathomable. How things change over the course of your lifetime will shape your expectations for your life. It shapes your options, whether you're privileged or oppressed, or the different ways in which you're privileged and oppressed. Consider all the ways the world has changed in just the short time that you've been alive. In the past, many theories of social change focused on the idea that all societies would pass through the same set of stages in the same order. These theories contained an assumption of progress, that all societies were moving towards being more civilized or simply better. These sorts of theories have largely been discredited. An example of this type of theory is Morgan's three stages, from savagery to barbarism to civilization. Morgan assumed that all civilizations would pass through these three stages. However, as we can see, many so-called civilized nations engage in what can only be called savagery or barbarism. Now we recognize that different routes might lead to the same, same stage of development and that we're not always necessarily moving to a better stage. A key flaw of linear theories was the assumption of cultural progress, that over time we are always necessarily progressing. There's no reason to assume that this is the case. We have many examples of civilizations degenerating or devolving. Cyclical theorists tend to assume that societies follow a life course, just like people. In this view, societies grow and then eventually decline and die. Challenges arise and societies adjust, but eventually order is maintained by force rather than consensus. Once this starts to occur, you're going to see decline. Decline may be slow. Some argue that the West is currently in decline. What do you think? In classic sociological thought, there are two ways that change occurs, materialist versus idealistic perspectives. Now, keep in mind, we are not using the colloquial definitions of these words, but specific sociological definitions. In this view, the materialist perspective is one in which the primary source of change is changes to material or external conditions. This might be things like changes in technology, changes in available resources. People's views or beliefs are going to follow from changes in the material conditions. Idealistic perspectives argue that changes in ideas, culture, or values or ideologies are what are going to drive change. That we're not really going to see people making large-scale changes in technology or the material conditions of existence unless they first have an ideology or belief system that is commensurate with these changes. If you're a materialist, the types of things you're going to see as causing social change are either changes in the natural environment or economic and technological types of change. I've shown you one key example of social change, which is the automobile. Many people argue the automobile led to all sorts of other changes in our society. Karl Marx is a classic example of a materialist view of social change. Marx's theory is called dialectical materialism and is based on the work of Hegel. In Marx's view, relations between forces of production or production technologies structure social and material life. In this view, your social class will determine your life chances, your culture, your ideologies, and so forth. Any changes in forces of production, technological production incentives, will erode the basis of the old system of economic relationships and classes, and therefore create new possibilities. The example that Marx gives in depth is a shift from feudalism to industrial capitalism. He points out how technological changes in the means of production and the forces of production led to all of these other changes in the society as a whole. 
Marx highlights, as the economic changes from feudalism to capitalism occur, we see concomitant changes in things like our legal system, our political system, and our ideologies. We go from being primarily monarchies to being primarily democracies. According to Marx, the things that lead to changes in the forces of production are contradictions in the system that eventually render it untenable. For example, under feudalism, the increasing middle class became richer and more powerful than many in the nobility. Obviously, this created a major contradiction for that system. Ogburn provides a materialist update to Marx's ideas. Ogburn focuses on the role of technology as a source of change. He gives the example of the automobile. In Ogburn's view, material culture or technology changes much faster than non-material aspects of culture. What he means by non-material aspects are our ideas, our values, our norms, and ideologies. We have to adjust these things as new inventions change our lifestyles. Ogburn highlights three steps of this process. Invention is when you combine existing elements and materials to create something new. The microchip changes communication and the way we communicate. Discovery is when reality is perceived in a new way. For example, cell theory really changed medical science. And finally, diffusion is the spread of a new invention or discovery. This may have extensive impacts on a culture. For example, the pill and the sexual revolution. Auburn argues that our society is generally unable to keep up with the rapid pace of technological change. Our norms, our values, our mores don't change as quickly as technology does. He argues this results in social problems and conflicts emerge. He hypothesizes that change results as society tries to catch up. Eventually, our norms, values, and mores will have to adapt to our changing circumstances. How did the automobile change expectations for social life. Technology can cause change in a number of ways. Innovation increases the number of alternatives available to a society. Think of all the different ways you can now use to contact someone when we used to have a much more limited range of alternatives. How does that change our expectations for social interaction? New technologies alter interaction patterns among individuals. For example, I find that people expect a much quicker response because of digital communication. If I'm having a non-digital day, I often find many angry emails, text messages, and phone calls waiting for me by people who expected me to respond immediately. Technological innovations also create new problems that need to be dealt with. Texting and driving and the dangers that it poses is a great new example. A great example of technological change comes from the Internet. I'm sure you have some relatives who can remember a time before the Internet. You might want to ask them some of the following questions. How did the advent of the Internet change daily life? How did patterns of social interaction change? One key example I see is that many of the weddings I now go to are for people who met online rather than in person. What new problems are arising? An example of that are the many ways that people are miscommunicate with each other because you can't necessarily hear tone in a text message. And what are the pros and cons of these changes? There have certainly been some good things, but there's also been some new problems. An alternate explanation for social change are idealistic perspectives. For idealists, it's actually ideas, values, and ideology that spur change. In this view, when our values change, then we see changes in our material conditions. The role of ideology is complex. What is ideology? Ideology is a complex belief system that explains social and political arrangements and relationships and underlies all social and political discourse and actions. In this view, there is no objective reality. It's important to note that idealists aren't arguing that ideas necessarily lead to technological change, but that a new technology won't be embraced unless that the values are already there that will lead to it being accepted. A classic example of the, of the idealistic perspective is that of Max Weber. In Weber's view, technological and material conditions are not enough to evince social change. He points out that many different nations had the ability to industrialize around the same time. Some did and some didn't. 
he noticed that there were commonalities among the nations that did industrialize, primarily a very specific view of work, money, and value. He highlights the fact that nations like England and the U.S. that had an ideological imperative towards wage labor and savings were far more likely to industrialize than other nations such as Catholic nations or India and China in which they, had, they valued other aspects of social life more. Weber lays out his theories in the book The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism. He argues there's an elective affinity between the Protestant work ethic and industrial capitalism. If he, when he compares Calvinism and Catholicism, Calvinism argued that you were predestined to salvation and you would be able to see that you were predestined if you were able to acquire a lot of wealth during your lifetime. By contrast, the Catholic Church had an imperative on asceticism and self-denial and charitable work. This did not exist in Calvinism. Weber argues this is why we see capitalism really taking off in Calvinist or Protestant nations as compared to Catholic nations. How might ideology be the driver of change? Well, in the first case, new technologies are only legitimated by certain social ideologies. Ideology may provide social solidarity among those attempting to evince change. Your ideology is going to highlight contradictions and problems. Some societies might choose to reject certain technologies because they see it as more problematic than valuable. Your ideas shift what you consider to be within the realm of the unfathomable and what is fathomable, what you can think about and what you won't even consider. And lastly, your ideals and your values are a primary source of your motivation to do things a particular way. Materialist or idealist, there isn't a right answer. It's up for you to decide which view of social change is more accurate in your view.